So, welcome to everybody for uh, this, this interesting webinar for this, that is a part of the e-seminars that are an exclusive benefit of the ERA members. It's a, it's a seminar that is organized by the ERA Renal Nutrition Working Group. And uh, I hope you will all enjoy it. Um, this year is indeed a very important year for guidelines. Uh, in the last period, we have the very important KGIGO guidelines and the Eastman guidelines that are sort of counterbalance uh, of these um, guidelines because they regard hospitalized patients with acute or chronic kidney disease. And we have the chance of having Alice Sabatino, who is a, a young uh very, very brighty, bright renal dietitian uh, with a very international background. She's now based in Parma in Italy, but she recently obtained a PhD at the University of Maastricht. And she's a passionate member, both of the board of the ERA uh, Renal Nutrition Group and of um, the Eastman Group. And she will talk today with us. She will share uh, the Eastman guideline on clinical nutrition in hospitalized patients with acute or chronic kidney disease. And this will be discussed by two panelists uh, that uh, reflect actually the very um, wide background of the members of the renal nutrition group. Ladies first, Karine Moreau from France. Uh, she says about her that her CV is very short. She's a nephrologist uh, taking care essentially of transplant patients. And uh, she's very understatement, but she published more than 40 papers. Uh, most of them um, addressed to, to a very important issue that is the, uh, the nutritional status of kidney transplant patients. And uh, she, she has the chance of having a great master that is Professor Aparicio and working with a good friend that is Philippe Chavot. Uh, the second panelist uh, is Andrew Davenport. Davenport. Uh, well, he is uh, he's curious active. He is the author of more than 400 papers. He's a consultant nephrologist in London with, at, at each time I see the list, there is something missing. There is acute kidney injury, hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, hepatorenal failure and nutrition and sarcopenia. Uh, and I realized when I was actually, when I was uh, browsing his CV, that he has an homonymous, uh, another Andrew Davenport, English producer, writer, composer, puppeteer, who is the author of Teletubbies. And I just wonder if it's the same family. I hope so. Must be fun. And myself, I am Georgina Piccoli. I'm something in between a clinician and uh, and. Uh, an occasional writer. Uh, my, I'm Italian, but I'm since five years uh, in Le Mans in central France. And uh, my main interests are hemodialysis, nutrition, and all what regards pregnancy and kidney disease. So now that we have introduced ourselves, uh, Alice, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here and thank you in advance for your presentation. Please, Alicia. Thank you, Georgina. Thank you for this kind introduction. I will now share my screen so we can start. Okay. You can see it. Now I will. So I will present the most recent Aspen guidelines on clinical nutrition for patients, hospitalized patients with kidney disease. 
And this is my disclosure of interest. And this is the group that we work at together to, to, to produce the SASPIN guideline that was published in, the, in 2021. Uh, the aim of the project was for um, we aim it to, to address this, this very heterogeneous patient population that are the hospitalized patients with kidney disease, because those are patients that may have a good kidney injury, a good kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, with or without renal, renal failure, with kidney failure. It's a veter, very heterogeneous population that often gets um, overlooked. This guideline is not intended to be applied in the outpatient setting of CKD patients that they are followed in nephrology clinics and, all, and also not in clinically stable CKD outpatients in hemodialysis, in chronic hemodialysis. It's also not for kidney transplantation and pediatric kidney disease. The methodology of the development of this guideline, uh, we define uh, recommendations based on the level of evidence that we had. Uh, the lowest recommendation corresponds to good practice point as expert consensus, which is GPP. And also, and the most, and the strongest one is the A, that we have uh, more strong evidence. Uh, we formulate recommendations as strong, uh, strong recommendations and also um, based on the strongest of the, the recommendation. In case of inconsistency, we base the recommendations in evidence, but also in the judgment of the group. And also we had this consensus uh, meeting that we would vote recommendations to, to reach a, a, a consensus on the recommendation. So we define the population based on the KD definitions of acute kidney injury, acute kidney disease, and CKD. And why we thought that this guideline was needed. Why do these different guidelines in this heterogeneous population? Because we know that malnutrition is very prevalent, it's highly prevalent in hospitalized patients. The data from the last nutrition day that included more almost 11,000 patients from European countries showed a prevalence of 15.5% of malnutrition. And that prevalence was even higher in the ICU with a prevalence of nearly 28% of malnutrition, which they found also it's more frequently observed in elderly patients and patients with chronic and acute diseases. And of course, as you can see here, when patients, uh, patients in the ICU have also acute kidney injury, we can find uh, prevalence of malnutrition of 60% in those patients. In the case of patients in the regular wards, nephrology wards, in the wards in the presence of kidney disease, the, the loss of kidney function, we have an increase in prevalence of 45% of patients that are malnourished in comparison to the general hospital population that is 15%. So that's why we thought it would be, it, it, is, it was a very opportune uh, uh, um, guideline that it should um, do it. Also, we say we, many evidence shows that malnutrition increase is an important cause of increased complications, longer hospitalization, longer recovery periods, and higher mortality in all patients, but also especially in patients with kidney impairment in the hospitals. Um, the, the guideline is divided in indication, assessment, timing, route of feeling, feeding, and individualized nutrient prescription and monitoring. I will briefly try to summarize the most important recommendations, and I really try not to make it too boring. I try not to read it because I know that presenting guidelines can be a little bit boring sometimes. So indication, which patients may receive medical nutrition, may have some benefit from it. We should consider medical nutrition therapy for any patient with kidney impairment that are hospitalized, that require hospitalization. We need to think that those patients might, all patients might need uh, some kind of medical nutrition intervention. So we need to screen all of them. Um, patients with kidney, hospitalized patients with kidney impairment, 
um, that are at risk for malnutrition, but that can safely feed orally, but you're not able to reach their nutritional requirements with regular diet alone, we should we shall offer it all nutritional supplements that also should be um, routine practice in the hospital. And we should also um, start enteral nutrition, parenteral nutrition, or combine it, combine it enteral and parenteral nutrition to, to critically ill and non critically ill patients with kidney impairment uh, that are unable to achieve at least 70% of macronutrients requirements with oral nutrition. So if even given uh, supplements, oral supplements, you are not able to reach 70% of requirements, then you should start to consider some artificial nutrition, and then we are going to, to see later which one we should prefer first. Um, so, as, as I said, uh, all patients, hospitalized patients with kidney impairment might be considered for medical nutrition, so we should try to screen all of them, to assess nutritional status in all of them, especially in those that are staying for more than 48 hours in the ICU. Uh, unfortunately, we still don't have a specific tool validated for this, uh, for patient, hospitalized patients with kidney impairment. So uh, we recommend to perform a general nutritional assessment in those patients to, to identify cases of, of malnutrition or risk of malnutrition. Uh, evidence shows that MUST has very poor sensitivity. Uh, the nutritional risk screening has a good sensitivity and prognostic capacity also in kidney patients. Uh, many studies were performed with subjective global assessment also in the ICU, but I think it's more difficult to be applied in the ICU in a routine basis for all patients. There is a new tool that we have evidence only from only one paper, the rena Wynut, that's for, for patients recovery in nephrology wards, that more studies are needed. To, to validate this tool in this clinical setting. So the recommendation for the assessment of nutritional status being a general assessment, uh, we focus also the recommendation, the assessment of body composition. Uh, the working group do not recommend the use of anthropometry, especially in patients with acute kidney injury in the ICU because of the increased uh, fluid overload and uh, the risk to mask and to, to um, excessive, uh, excessively uh, estimate a fake um, muscle mass that actually is masked by, by fluid, excess fluid. So we recommend uh, other body composition assessment tools. We focus the discussion on the application of quadriceps muscle ultrasound, ultrasound especially for monitoring of muscle mass. And also for patients that undergo uh, abdominal CT for clinical reasons, the evaluation of the skeletal muscle at the L3, the vertebra L3, at the level of the L3 vertebra, is a very good prognostic, has a very good prognostic factor. In collaborative patients, it's, it should be, it would be useful to apply and to assess also muscle function because it's a very important prognostic factor re regarding also um, not only mortality, but also quality of life and the um, function recovery and recovery after ICU. So it's recommended to use it and the hand grip strength in collaborative patients if possible. And here we have some recommendations regarding timing and the route of feeding. Um, since uh, there wasn't um, evidence on this particular population, but considering that um, it's been shown that uh, acute kidney injury, kidney impairment itself is not um, a definite uh, um, cost to, to, to change recommendations regarding the, the when to start that, the, the artificial nutrition or which routes to choose, we referred to the recommendations from the Aspen guidelines for polymorbid internal medicine patients and also patients with critically ill, for critically ill patients. So uh, parenteral nutrition, well, the indication of parenteral nutrition was also referred to the Aspen guidelines for critically ill patients. So we didn't want to, we wanted to avoid repetitions. 
so as in other clinical settings, enteral nutrition is the most physiological route of feeding in comparison to parenteral nutrition, has been linked into lower infection rates, short ICU and hospital stays in general. So we recommend to start enteral nutrition within 48 hours after ICU admission in patients with acute kidney injury. And parenteral nutrition should be started only uh, in case of contraindication to enteral nutrition, but we should wait three to seven days to start parenteral nutrition patients in the ICU. And only when patients are severely malnourished, you could think of starting parenteral nutrition a little bit earlier, but to increase it very slow, only if enteral nutrition is not possible. Of course, enteral nutrition should be delayed uh, in case there is shock uh, and hemodynamic instability with problems with tissue perfusion. And, and as soon as shocks control, low dose of enteral nutrition can be started. Life-threatening hypoxemia, hyper hypercapnia or acidosis. Uh, we should also delay the beginning of enteral nutrition uh, if patient is suffering from active upper GI bleeding. And also uh, patients with bowel ischemia and high output intestinal fistulas if reliable feeding access to the, that is distal to the fistula is not achievable. And if patients have abdominal compartment syndrome and gastric aspirate volume is above 500 milliliters in six hours. That, those are the only reasons that we should delay enteral nutrition according to the ASPEN guideline in, the, in critically ill patients. And we agreed with that recommendation and in, incorporated that on, in our guideline. So here, uh, regarding the individualized nutrient prescriptions and how to uh, estimate or measure energy requirements, mm -hmm. um, every, we agree with a strong consensus that cal indirect calorimetry should be used to assess energy expenditure to guide nutritional therapy and avoid under or overfeeding. I know that indirect cal calorimetry is not available in every hospital and that is very difficult to apply in some places. Uh, so if calorimetry is not available, there is um, an option when patients are ventilated and you sh we should derive a a a energy requirements using VO2, consum VO2, the oxygen consumption, or the VCO2 carbon dioxide production derived from the ventilator that would give a better evaluation on energy expenditure than predict predictive equations. And this is the recommended equation that was also recommended in the ASPEN guideline for critically ill patients. And that the reason that we can't recommend one equation is that the available evidence shows that there's much, much uh, problem with the the um, agreement of this these equations uh, with the direct calorimetry. If you see in this table, here are the patients. The percent of estimates between ninety and one hundred and ten percent of indirect calorimetry. So we don't have a very important underfeeding and don't have overfeeding, but only uh, using different equations less than 50% of patients were in this range. And as you can see also for all equations, the limits of agreements with indirect calorimetry were very wide. We cannot recommend one equation over the other. In other discussions that we had when presenting these guidelines, um, people asked, but what should we do? And uh, the, the consensus of all the, 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 the experts that were discussing this issue during the presentations was that you should stay low, uh, especially in the ICU. We start, if you really need a pocket equation, you should stay with 20 to 25 to kilocalories per, per kilo per day and try to use the most recent real weight, not the actual weight, maybe the weight, body weight before uh, recovery um, 
because we need to be aware that our patients are also over with fluid overload in many, many cases. So that's why there is no recommendation regarding a specific equation. Also, still regarding uh, energy requirements, it's important also to consider that kidney replacement therapy may provide additional calories that are given in the form of citrate, lactate, and glucose from dialysis and hemofiltration solutions. And we should include this energy, this extra energy in the calculations to avoid overfeeding. That's because citrate, glucose, and lactate provide calories three to 3.6 kilocalories per gram. And it will depend on the protocol used. In this paper from Udemans van Schatten from 2011, uh, um, this protocol that was studied provided close to 333 kilocalories per, per day extra, that if you were not counting in your calculations, it would be extra uh, energy that patients would receive. In this other paper from 2012, the amount of extra calories from their protocol of dialysis protocol was up to 1,200 calories per day, which is very important, very much important when you are dealing with patients, especially in the ICU, that overfeeding can have so many negative consequences. As for protein requirements, we need to be aware that kidney replacement therapy can have a negative influence in protein balancing, including amino acid and protein losses. As a consequence, we need to increase protein intake for patients undergoing kidney replacement therapy. Um, older studies that perform a protein catabolic rate on those patients that were uh, doing receiving kidney replacement therapy and there were different prolonged therapies or continuous uh, kidney replacement therapies, they found um, an average protein catabolic rate of 1.5 grams per kilo per day, which could represent uh, in a 75 kilogram patients in a week, almost three kilograms of skeletal muscle loss. So it's very important to try to keep, uh, to, to replace that, um, that amount of protein amino acids that are lost and to increase protein intake in these patients. The recommendations that we made in these in this guidelines for protein intake were mainly expert opinion based because there were not enough evidence for all for all, all types of, of all, condi all conditions of patients with kidney disease because as I said it's a very heterogeneous population so we may have hospitalized patients that have chronic kidney disease, but don't have an acute or critical illness. Maybe they are there because of a hypertensive crisis and, and they uh, um, needed hospitalization for that. In this case, that's the only case that you might consider to keep their renal diet or go up to 0 0.8 grams per kilo of body weight per day. That's the only, only reason, only condition. Uh, then you have hospitalized patients with chronic kidney disease with kidney failure on conventional dialysis, but that don't have acute critical illness. So you keep the KDOC recommendation of 1.2 grams per kilo per day. Uh, patients that have acute kidney injury but don't have a critical illness, maybe you have a contrast induced acute kidney injury. You should not perform a, a, a low protein diet, a classic low protein diet of 0 0.6, but you can stay to 0 0.8 to one grams per kilo per day. And, and also that could be the case one grams per kilo per day for patients in the ICU that do not undergo kidney replacement therapy and increase it to until up to 1.3 grams per kilo per day if tolerated. Uh, but you should not delay. Uh, I, I will tell you that uh, later and shortly. Critically ill patients that have any kind of kidney disease that are undergoing kidney replacement therapy, they should receive more protein, 1.3 to 1.5. And when you perform continuous kidney replacement therapy, then you should increase even, even more, 1.5 to 1.7. Um, the body weight to be used in this case would be, if available, the pre-hospitalization body weight or usual body weight. 
they, it might be preferred to over the ideal body weight because that might be more close to their real weight. But we should never use actual body weight for this population because, uh, as I said, they can be very highly fluid overloaded and the, the, the excess liquid could um, increase body weight and cause overfeeding. Uh, one thing that had a strong recommendation and strong consensus that you should not uh, reduce protein intake in order to avoid or, or delay kidney replacement start in these critical patients with kidney disease, because you would not prevent the, the 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 beginning of kidney replacement therapy anyway, and you could only harm your patient by reducing the amount of protein that they they are receiving. Requiring micronutrients, uh, trace elements and vitamins, if possible, they should be monitored because we lose um, trace elements and water-soluble vitamins during kidney replacement therapy. And increased attention should be given to selenium, zinc, and copper as for the trace elements. And for the water-soluble vitamins, should, attention should be given to vitamin C, folate, and thiamine. If you can monitor folate and thiamine, that would be um, good. But if not, maybe consider some supplementation and to, to cover for possible losses if patients are undergoing prolonged kidney replacement therapy. There is no recommendation to give uh, disease-specific uh, intra or parenteral nutrition for all patients uh, in comparison to conventional formulas. Instead, we should individualize these recommendations. Selected patients that have electrolyte and fluid imbalance, they could benefit uh, from concentrated renal diets, as we call renal diets that have lower electrolyte content and also have a more concentrated, increased uh, caloric density. And also more, there are more concentrated formulas so we can um, work with the problem of fluid overload and also some formulas with lower electrolyte that be, may be preferred over standard formulas, but that should be individualized based on the, on the patient situation, not give it for everybody. It may not be beneficial for everybody. Uh, as for other special nutrients like glutamine, critical ill patients with kidney impairment should not receive uh, glutamine supplementation it should not be administered. And that came from the special, mainly from the Redox study that showed that patients that had more than two organ failures uh, had an increased risk uh, of odds ratio for mortality uh, when receiving glutamine. And usually the, the third organ failure is kidney failure. And that's what they found that patients with acute kidney injury were not receiving any benefit from glutamine supplementation, instead also causing harm. As for electrolytes, we know that electrolyte abnormalities are common in patients with kidney impairment and they shall be closed monitored. There, may, there can be different electrolyte abnormalities depending on the, the, the stage or the situation of, of patients. Usually kidney disease related disorders uh, relates to hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, and hypocalcemia. However, when we start kidney replacement therapy, especially the prolonged ones, continuous replacement therapy, or intermittent prolonged uh, uh, therapies, we may have hypokalemia, hypophosphatemia, hypomagnesemia. So the, the electrolyte disorders may change, so very important to monitor. And what might be recommended is to use dialysis solution containing potassium, phosphate, and magnesium to try to correct for electrolyte disturbances in patients undergoing kidney replacement therapy instead of maybe providing intravenous uh, supplementation in the case of hypo, if a patient presents hypophosphatemia, hypokalemia, and hypomagnesemia, it would be better to use dialysis solution that contains those electrolytes. So the conclusion of this guideline that we, we, we reach with this guideline is that patients, hospitalized patients with kidney disease 
it's a very heterogeneous population that with very nutrient needs and intakes, they are a also a population with high risk of malnutrition in which nutritional assessment must be performed and we should adapt to nutritional prescription frequently, revising it based on the, the, the current stage of the kidney impairment and integrate it with kidney replacement therapy. We try to, to, to provide practical recommendations and statements that we're aiming at defining suggestions for the everyday clinical practice and to help to individualize nutritional support in this patient setting. And I, I hope we were able to, to help clinicians in their everyday practices with some practice recommendations and hope you read the guideline and like it. And I thank you very much for your attention. And I think we can start the discussion now with the panelists. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Alice, uh, for this very um, careful resume of the most important aspects of these guidelines that are, of course, is all, uh, it's a, it, they are very interesting guidelines because they are a mix of evidence and opinion. And this is something that happens uh, quite frequently uh, in these fields of which, uh, over which there are more uh, reviews, opinion, observational studies than RCTs. And they probably, it's probably also something that make us reflect on the fact that we rely too much on RCTs and too little probably on well-studied clinical series. Uh, and this is why I think they will raise a lot of questions. At least I have many, but uh, this time for being fair with both genders, I will let the man discussing first. So now, Andrew, as panelist, your comments. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Alicia and her team for all the effort they've put in to review the literature and draw up these uh, clinical guidelines. Now, you quoted one of the papers by uh, Hayland, and he was one of the people who showed that the concept of overnutrition in the intensive care unit could actually cause increased mortality in patients. Now, of course, he assessed those patients using the Nutrix score. Um, so it's obviously therefore very important to have some sort of firm guidelines actually about how to assess the nutritional uh, assessment of a patient. And one of the things you suggested was to do an ultrasound scan of the quadriceps. Now, there's a very nice paper from um, London, but not London, UK, but London, Ontario, where they looked at the quadriceps with MRI scanning pre and post a hemodialysis session, showing that muscle, because it contains 70% water, um, expands if you're overhydrated. And as you rightly said, a lot of intensive care patients will have excess fluid in different compartments. And so again, even the quadriceps muscle will be volume expanded in patients who are septic and are given fluids as part of resuscitation. So these measurements are actually very difficult to, to come up with very firm guidelines. So in your, if you have to address, let's say, the audience, how would you go around clinically assessing patients in terms of nutrition as to who you need to give more food, uh, nutrients to and who possibly we need to be more conservative with? So as regarding the, the comment on the ultrasound, it's interesting because we also perform the studies with uh, our patients with acute kidney injury and we perform it at measurements before and after the dialysis. And we didn't find any difference in measurements actually before and after dialysis. So that's why we were also very sure that, that the, the, the measurements wouldn't be very influenced. We also performed that in chronic hemodialysis patients, the same study before and after dialysis and they didn't notice any difference in measurements. And also we performed another study where we monitored patients in the ICU with acute kidney injuries and measured at baseline and after five days. And we were able to detect a reduction in muscle 
uh, muscle thickness with ultrasound. And that was also related with, with uh, outcome, with prolonged stay or discharge from home. Patients that were severely lost more severely muscle would have a higher probability to have a longer uh, prolonged stay in the hospital. So that's also why the, the ultrasound entered the guideline is a monitoring tool, not an assessment tool because we don't have reference values. Uh, but I think that it's difficult to assess nutritional status in this patient. So we need to perform a comprehensive assessment if possible. And we need to see if patients are need any, um, can start early nutrition if there are in the ICU, they are ventilated, if we can start it early or if it's necessary to delay and how long these patients have been receiving less than the 70% of their, their intake. But we need to have a dedicated, a dedicated person to perform that assessment. I think it's a little bit difficult to leave that only on physicians that are following patients every day and that need to do many other things with the patient, not only assess nutritional status. Um, what I would um, leave as more the, the priority in, the case, in this case would be considering all ICU and ward patients, maybe the elderly with more chronic comorbidities. And in the ICU, try to provide uh, not much energy, but provide them adequate amount of protein. And in the ward, we could try to keep a, a higher amount of, of energy and use oral nutritional supplements in patients that can eat orally. But I think I would focus more on elderly patients and with more comorbidities uh, in the ICU or ventilated patients or more critically ill patients. But interestingly, if you're going to target, let's say, older patients, those with more comorbidity, then you're almost going down the Nutrix score, but it was one of the scores that you didn't mention today in terms of assessment of patients, which is, I think, of interest. I, oh, we didn't mention because there was, it was not studied in the renal population, but as we recommended, any validated score could be applied, any validated score could be used because we don't have one specific score for this population, only the must score that was the one that had, was less sensitive, that was not recommended, but any other score that is validated in the general hospitalized patients could be used. Okay, and can I just turn to um, continuous forms of renal replacement therapy? And as you mentioned, um, quite a number of units will use citrate as an anticoagulant and often use it citrate combined with glucose. Now, the issue here, of course, is that the assumption is that the citrate molecules that go back into the patient are then fully oxidized in terms of the, the calorific content. And I'm unsure as to whether we actually have the evidence that there is full oxidation of citrate molecules, uh, et, et cetera. So I'm unsure about how strong that evidence actually is. W would you like to comment on that? Well, we don't know how much is oxidated, but we know that uh, an amount is oxidated. So we need, Maybe it's not very easy to calculate the amount of energy that you're giving. You know the amount that you're giving, but you don't know how much you are using. Mm. It should not be underrated if you use a protocol like the, the one. It's, a, it's an old study notes from 2012, and protocols now are different and may be providing less calories. But you, if you are performing that kind of protocol, if continues, you can, you're providing 1,200 uh, calories per day uh, more than you were given. And of course, and you're oxidizing a part of that. So it's important to consider that you are giving some energy and th that energy without any protein could uh, contribute to overfeeding. I think that's that's my opinion. You, you are more expert than me, of course, in that, in that regard. No, no, but you're quite right. If you go back to those those early papers, the volumes being exchanged are probably much higher than we do today. So there are changes in clinical practice and also in terms of the actual citrate solutions. Um, the other question I do have for you, though, about continuous renal replacement therapy is the thermal balance and the thermal losses. Okay. So, so have you any comment in terms of 
how to try and adjust the nutrition in patients who are on continuous renal replacement therapy, and we'll have natural thermal losses because of the, the, the renal replacement therapy. So in the guideline, we, we saw the evidence that before the, the guideline, there was no recommend that there was a recommendation to not perform indirect calorimetry during kidney replacement therapy. And then some evidence came and it looks like that indirect calorimetry during kidney replacement therapy didn't change too much. The most, I uh, think that the, mo the most, con the, the biggest concern, I think it was for the loss of, of CO2 that would change results, but it looks like um, that, that doesn't change too much. But I know that during renal replacement therapy, you have a, a reduce in, in, in the temperature of the body, but you have also an activation of the catabolism. So I think may might compensate, but I couldn't tell you for sure because I'm not an expert in, in kidney replacement therapy and not a nephrologist. So I, I won't go further on this subject to, because I don't want to say anything Right. Wrong. <laughs> okay, and there's just one other thing I'd like to, to ask you about the intensive care side of things. And that's this, that um, you mentioned measuring trace elements. So zinc is tightly bound to alpin. There's very little in the way of free zinc in the plasma water. And similarly, selenium is bound to selenoproteins predominantly, and to, to some extent, a little bit of albumin. And again, copper is bound to caridoplasmin. So the problem that laboratories would have is that they don't measure free amounts okay. in total. So the question I then have is that if you have somebody who has a reduced albumin because they're sick, they're septic, then the zinc levels will be a little bit on the lower side because albumin is lower. So how, how, how do you advise people to interpret that? Because in fact, you can actually precipitate copper toxicity, or sorry, copper deficiency, I should say, by giving extra zinc, for example. Okay. So, you know, in some parts of the body, the receptor is a divalent ion receptor. It doesn't matter whether it's copper or zinc, it activates the receptor. But in other parts of the body, they actually inhibit each other. So, okay. so do you have any comments on that? <laughs> sorry, I cannot comment on that. I'm sorry. I'm not a, an expert on that. What we do and what we recommend in the guideline is to consider that kidney replacement therapy will remove trace elements and remove water-soluble vitamins. And that if you are performing a prolonged for, for many days and weeks, the, 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 the kidney replacement therapy, you should consider supplementing with trace elements and water-soluble vitamins to account for that. All right. Okay, so may I just have a little break between uh, this uh, interesting discussion um, that highlights very well uh, how many aspects, I have a very long list, uh, but um, before that I would like to, uh, to listen to, uh, to the opinion of a nephrologist with special experience on transplantation. So the of other types of critically ill hospitalized patients. So Karin, please, your yes. comments. And thank questions. you, thank you, thank you. Yes, um, thank you, uh, Alice, for this nice presentation. I have a uh, main comment, in fact. Um, these guidelines um, are mainly related to the nutritional care of patients with uh, acute kidney injury. Uh, but are uh, in intensive care units with uh, renal replacement therapy, but mainly continuous renal replacement therapy. Uh, and I wonder uh, what to do uh, for our patients with CKD, but with acute illness, so acute kidney injury or something else, uh, with um, an hospitalization uh, in a medical uh, unit, but not intensive care unit. So it's the acute situation you described well, well, well and that are um, described in the guidelines. Uh, 
So we have to take care of uh, nutrition for these uh, patients. But um, I wonder if it's not more difficult to challenge this therapy, nutritional therapy in these patients. I mean that uh, when patients are hospitalized in a medical uh, unit, standard medical unit, and they need renal replacement therapy, uh, we have to take care of free overload, uh, potassium, phosphorus, and many of us may think that if you uh, provide uh, nutritional therapy with enteral therapy, nutritional therapy, you will cause uh, free overload, uh, hyperkaliemia, uh, high phosphorus, phosphorus level, and then you may need more renal replacement therapy. So that means uh, rather than three sessions a week, four or five sessions a week. And I think that uh, for some um, physicians, uh, it may be a cause to delay the uh, start of uh, medical therapy or maybe uh, to prefer the uh, intradialytic parental nerve uh, nutrition therapy, uh, even if the patient uh, needs enteral therapy. What do you think of this? Oh, um, I think, and also the, the guideline recommends not delaying in no. um, intervention because you only mono, you will, will cause a, a state of malnutrition, important malnutrition with your patient that might difficult recovery also from the acute condition that the patient has. And if you should try to use, in this case, you should try to use the more concentrated formulas to provide the least amount of liquids that you can. And if you need to do more renal replacement therapies, you, sh you should do that. But I think yes. you should not, um, I don't know, avoid renal replacement therapy on the expense of patients' nutritional status. That's what we recommend. And that's also what I think personally. Thank you. Um, when I read these uh, guidelines, I wonder, uh, what is the specificity of uh, our patients with kidney disease uh, compared to the patients that are uh, hospitalized in the intensive care unit uh, with uh, over acute illness? So, I mean, the expense uh, produced guidelines uh, two years ago about uh, acute illness and uh, intensive care uh, unit. Uh, so uh, what are the difference uh, for our patients with CKD uh, for the nutritional care in this situation? Are there specific uh, points to develop? So you are, say, you are asking the difference between the patients with CKD in the regular wards or in no, general? It, with, in the, the patients with CKD in intensive care units. Ah, which, what's so, the difference? Are they so different than patients with no CKD? Uh, yes, because they have the, uh, the negative effects of the kidney derangement that will add to the, the, the risk of malnutrition that patients without CKD have. And also they are more prone to acute kidney injury. Yes, at the time, at the time of the hospitalization, hospitalization they, they are, most of them are already malnutrition. Already, already acute kidney yes, injury before. above but the CKD. I wonder if the care is so different. I think it's not different, the care between the uh, acute illness and the hospitalization. You think it's not different, the care with the acute illness without kidney impairment yes. and mm. acute illness with kidney impairment. And regarding energy, it's not different, but regarding protein, it can be very different. Because 
it will depend on the if they are receiving kidney replacement therapy or not. Mm. That increases their their protein need. And so may I so add many this? recommendations from the the guideline on critical ill patients. Yes. I just uh, there there is one only one question. Uh, so I I warmly invite uh, the thirty five people that I see are uh, watching us to to add some questions, but. There is one question that is uh, somehow in this line, the only one we received, that is, uh, is recommended protein intake? Does it depend on CKD stages and proteinuria level in these, of course, hospitalized critically ill patients? Um, I think this question is not related to on dialysis or not on dialysis. Would you please comment on that? So as we recommended in the guideline, although there is a lack of evidence, as we said, we, it was mainly expert opinion, we do not recommend to assess uh, the protein intake on the presence of the CKD. The no, this is the recommended protein intake, not the yeah. assessed. Uh, yeah, sorry. We do not recommend to use the recommend the, the protein intake based only on CKD stages. It's also we need to see what brought what was the cause of the, the hospitalization of the patient. And there was different levels on that. And the only patients that we should consider could consider to keep their low protein diet are those patients that have CKD but don't have any acute illness, maybe hospitalized because of a an um, hypertensive episode or I don't know. Um, kidney stones, I know, something that would not cause an increase in their needs, not a catabolic uh, factor that would be the only, the only moment that we recommend to, to, to think, to consider, to, to keep the low protein take, but it's not a, a moment that we should consider CKD stages to, to provide uh, protein. That's what the guideline recommend. Our recommendation as a group. <laughs> Karine, something to add? Yeah, Karine, your opinion? Um, yes, I, I had something to just comment, um, not about the protein intake. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe you comment on the question about protein intake. So, of course, there is, uh, it's not time to reduce protein intake in uh, an acute situation, but uh i i was uh, i wonder uh, is there a place maybe georgina can help us to answer this question is there a place uh, in in an acute situation for the ceto analogs uh, to increase uh, amino acids uh, levels and uh, intake and, and so on? do you think georgina <laughs> oh well i think it's a is a it's a the question is simple and difficult at a time. That is, we all try to do our best in all patients. I'm personally following up something that fits with a guideline, but um, let's say energy first and protein second. Uh, sometimes I have the impression that you, we put too much emphasis on protein intake and not enough on calories, apart from the fact when you are on renal replacement therapy and you absorb sugars, etc. But often our patients eat too little. And in this context, um, I prefer to keep uh, relatively low the protein intake with respect to calories, because I think that, um, well, I think we, we know that having a too high uh, an unbalanced quantity of proteins, especially of animal origins with respect to calories, Im impairs, uh, gives a hypercatabolism, uh, impairs the, the acid base balance that is in turn uh, a, a fantastic anorexic agent, um, and so on. So um, I think that 
in the optics of calories first, keto analogs may be useful in some situations in which you don't want to increase too much um, the, the urea levels, and that can be of some help. But it also depends on the patients that are patients that eat so little. And we all know uh, and we all prefer, and the guidelines underlines it very, very well, how much is more important to take food uh, via the normal oral way. So whenever the patient has enough calories and not enough proteins and prefers eating pills like an, a cosmonaut instead of uh, eating mm, colored uh, yogurt full of everything inside. Well, in that case, they are very useful. We use them a lot in, in dialysis patients uh, as for an integration in those who not like sweets because most of, uh, of uh, chronic complements are a little bit too sweet. But I think it depends very much upon, upon the patient. And I think it's useful to have them. But the point is that you have to have a pretty well-working metabolic machinery to use them. Mm -hmm. If yeah. you have zero of free albumin and everything is leveled down, no way you can give anything good or bad to eat. It will not be of a great use. And I see the hand of Andrew. Andrew. <laughs> Sorry. Andrew, last four to you. Okay, the only thing I was going to say is that when patients get admitted to hospital, they become very immobile. And I therefore feel just as, just as important as nutrition is getting our therapists to try and get the patients out of bed, yeah. getting them moving around. And even in the ICU, even when they're ventilated, getting our, our physiotherapists to get moving the legs and arms, etc. So I think getting people to move around and getting those muscles to work is equally as important as the nutrition. Yes. Effects. Yes, I agree. You convince a convinced. <laughs> so, any other comments? I would like to comment to what we're saying that calories first. That might be true, maybe for patients in the regular uh, nephrology ward that uh, are not in the in the ICU, because in the ICU, uh, many studies already have shown that. Calories is not first. Uh, we, we um, I, I was saying not in the ICU, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Oh, outside of the, yeah, yeah. Our, the ICU is a separation that we're making. It's it. another word. Yeah. Uh, but I think that indeed, uh, to make a, a short final comment, uh, I think that I hope that this talk, your bright talk, uh, our different comments uh, will, um, will enhance the curiosity of us nephrologists to, to read a paper on a pure nutritional journal, clinical nutrition, and to go a little bit further in trying to disentangle the many questions that are still unanswered. And um, because I think that this part of uh, nutritional management uh, is so, I mean, uh, as the famous song says, you have to get in to get out. So uh, what we eat uh, re regulates, also regulates not only what we are, but also the way we prescribe renal replacement therapy and the way we intervene to, with our patients in acute as well in chronic conditions. So I think that one of the advantages of this very interesting uh, guideline that has also the merit of stressing opinions, uh, so of opening discussions, as you very brightly discussed, uh, is to, uh, to enhance research, working and thinking, just thinking about that more often in our clinical work. We need more dietitians. You're precious, but not everybody is so rich uh, to have no, a renal yes. dietitian in the team. So we have to, to work more together. 
And I think this is just the start. And uh, since the era is a very, uh, very precise, uh, has very precise webinars, let me just thank Alice first, Andrew and Karin second, and not least uh, all the ERA staff for organizing uh, this webinar and have you all a very nice evening and a beautiful Christmas to you all. <laughs>